good afternoon. I'm glad you're having such a good time talking with all the interesting people at your table, but it's time to begin our Friday Forum. I'm Corlene Kraft. I am the president-elect of City Club, and I'm happy to welcome uh, Superintendent Susan Castillo today, who's our state superintendent of public instruction, who will speak on the state of Oregon schools, and Chris Smith, our board host today. Uh, before we begin the presentation, we have just a few items that we need to mention. And our program next Friday is one of them. Um, it will be September 26th, and it's going to try to sus dispel some of the mystery surrounding what's going on in Clark County. You sometimes think that the Columbia River is akin to the Berlin Wall, but there is so much synergy going on between the two states. So we're going to have Craig Pridemore, who's um, the chair of the Clark County Board of Commissioners, and Metro Councilor Rex Burkholder. If you'd like to reserve, you can call the City Club or do it online at uh, www, and you have to put that in for some reason, pdxcityclub.org. Um, the City Club Annual Fund is well underway, and we've been very happy with the generosity of so many people already, because the, the Annual Fund gives us about a third of our operating budget for the year. We realize there are many worthwhile organizations to which you could contribute, but we, we think that City Club is unique. How many places can you hear state, county, city, and national leaders speak about the state of their, the state of their, whatever it is, it's the state, the city, uh, the city council, et cetera, and where else can you hear speakers on a broad array of topics about a great many items of interest? We would like to believe that this is the sought after forum. So any contributions that you can make to help us out, large or small, you notice how I led with that, large or small, um, we, in the form of checks, cash, money orders, or we'd be happy to have you uh, put it on your credit card and you can do it in monthly increments if you like. So thank you very much in advance for that. Um, I would like to introduce some new members today. We have a new member, Annette Matson. if she could stand. If any of, thank you, hi, Annette. <laughs> Please welcome Chris, Kristen Rencher. Hi, Kristen, welcome. And Patricia Shields. Hello, welcome, Patricia. Uh, we are going to be having a new member reception on Tuesday, October 7th, and everyone in the club is invited to attend. It will be held at the club offices from 4 to 6 on October 7th, and people from the research, the program, and the issue committees will be there to help people understand how to get more involved with the club and exactly what is going on with those, um, with those groups. And please feel free to attend, members or non-members, just for a get-together with some food and drink. We have a new program with which we're involved. This Board of Governors has been dedicated to expanding the reach of City Club, and uh, we're now a community partner of the World Affairs Council, which is very interesting um, interaction between the two of us. If you are interested in subscribing to their annual forums, their international speaker series, 20% of the ticket purchase will be donated to City Club if you mention that you heard about the series at City Club. And their first forum is going to be held on Thursday, October 16th, and it's very timely and should be fascinating because it features former Israeli Prime Minister Shimon Peres and Palestinian Foreign, Amers, Foreign Affairs Minister Nabil Shaath. And more information is available on the tables at the back of the room. And broadcast of the City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting by, from PGE and Washington Mutual, and we're very, very grateful for their support. Now on to our program. Today, as I said, we're very happy to have State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Susan Castillo, who just took this post in January. She, Ms. Castillo received a BA in Communications from Oregon State University and was the first Hispanic woman in the Oregon Legislative Assembly. She served in the State Senate from 1997 until 2002, and prior to that, she was an award-winning journalist for KVAL-TV in Eugene. She will help us understand how we can have Gary Crudeau Gary Trudeau making us a national laughing stock on the one hand, yet graduating seniors who lead the nation in SATs and ACTs. So Ms. Castillo, if you can please tell us what is going on in Oregon schools.
Thank you. It is really great to be with you today. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. And um, I have to tell you that it is fantastic that you all come together once a week to uh, listen and to discuss the very important issues that are before our state and our country. And uh, I guess I this is a characteristic about Oregonians that I absolutely love, the commitment to community and the dedication to debate about all of those important issues. Well, as you just heard, I, I officially took office in January, and let me tell you what a, a full nine months it has been up to this date. During uh, the time that I was campaigning, I can't tell you how many times people would say to me, um, why in the world would you want to take on this job <laughs> under these very challenging times with all of these very difficult challenges for our schools? And my response has always been, how could you not? There is nothing more important for all of us to be engaged and working on than helping our schools. And of course, the other part of that is that I knew that if I became a statewide elected official, that there was a chance that someday I would get asked to speak to the Portland City Club. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> well, we have an exceptional education system in the state of Oregon. And I, I just want to uh, share uh, a story. I was talking with a reporter the other day who asked me, you know, what has been the biggest surprise for you since you've become the superintendent in Oregon? And I thought about it, and, and I guess it was, my response was that, um, you know, I knew we had good schools in Oregon as, as I saw what was happening in our schools, uh, reporting on schools in Eugene and around the state. And then also uh, sitting on the Senate Education Committee and, and understanding what was happening with education in Oregon as we were moving forward on our school reform efforts and creating more success for more kids here. But it's been through my experience at getting together with my peers around the country that it has really hit home for me just how good we are. We rock in Oregon in public education. We do. <laughs> We have, we have people across this country who look at us for leadership, who admire the high standards that we have and our comprehensive assessments that we have, and they're asking me, Susan, what is going on in Oregon? You guys have been leaders. Is that at risk with what's happening right now with the budget crisis that you have? And my answer is yes, it is at risk. We have students that are meeting higher standards each year because of talented teachers, visionary leaders, and committed public servants that dedicate their lives to the betterment of our children. Oregon's educators, and I recognize several in this room, we have a table of teachers over here, are the foundation of our communities. We need to celebrate our teachers. Our teachers are the ones in the classrooms keeping hope alive, even though on the outside of those school buildings, budget negotiations and political pandering tend to dominate the discussion about how to best educate our children. Our teachers are the ones who really know what our students need, and they are the ones who roll up their sleeves every day to get the job done, working to give every child They are working to give every child the best education possible. There is no part-time work at full-time pay, as we heard on talk radio this week for our teachers. Our teachers are professionals, and the only professionals I know of who have worked for two weeks without pay right here in Portland because of their sense of responsibility and accountability to our children and our communities. And we know that teachers are not paid commensurate to other professionals in society, but they perform one of the most important jobs. And I know that our teachers are working overtime, not part-time. I worry that too many people are not aware of our accomplishments in public education in Oregon and the fact that we have a winning program to invest in because they hear so much about budget debates and tax talk. Let's look around this room. We are all here today because we received an education. We were offered opportunities 
because we were educated. We pursued our dreams and we still are because we had access to an education that taught us how to be successful in this endless world of knowledge. Well, I know firsthand what an incomplete education means to the life of a student and that student's family. I'm the only person in my family to have received a university education. My mother dropped out of school when she was in the eighth grade because she was struggling to learn uh, English. And as I was growing up, my mother, uh, throughout our lives and throughout her lives, always she was expressing regret about not completing uh, her education and how there were doors of opportunity shut to her because of that. And I learned at an early age the direct connection between education and opportunity. And as state superintendent, I'm dedicated to keeping those doors of opportunity open so that Oregon can move from a state where many students reach high academic standards to one where all students achieve academic excellence. For more than a decade now, our students in our schools have been doing more with less. Even with fewer resources, though, I am proud to report that overall student performance is up. Third grade reading and math proficiency scores are on a rising trend. Our high school seniors continue to lead the nation in SAT and ACT scores. Our dropout rates have decreased for the fourth year in a row to approximately 5%, which is contrary to a re report you may have read about in Tuesday's paper. The report didn't look at all of the information about those statistics, such as alternative high school diplomas for special education students and other students with disabilities and high school equivalencies. The truth is that we have more students going to college than ever before, right here in Oregon. Now these accomplishments are significant and we should all be proud that our students are rising to the occasion even when fiscal support is so uncertain. But I think that you would agree with me that it is past time that we give our students and our schools the chance to see how much more they can do with more. And while we have great achievements that draw national praise, there are some fundamental problems in our system that cannot go unaddressed if we are to meet our goal of every one, every day, a success. Which leads me to two critical gaps between where we should be and where we are, the funding gap and the achievement gap. First, let's talk about the funding gap. This is a gap between what we really need and what we actually have. In order to have schools funded at the September 2001 level, we would need five and a half billion dollars for the next two years. Well, right now, we don't have that. In order to fully implement the quality education model, which describes the kind of class sizes, the investment in professional development, and other characteristics that our schools would need for 90% of students to meet our high academic standards, we would need six and a half billion dollars today. And I don't need to tell you that we don't have that either. What we need and what we have are very different stories. What we do have, as appropriated by the legislature, is $5.2 billion for the next two years, with another $100 million if the economy improves. Well, I call that $100 million hope money, not real money. A kind of strange education scratch-off game, I guess. Well, the newest caveat, which I'll go into more detail about later, is that this figure, 5.2, is uncertain and could possibly reduce to $4.8 billion. And regardless of this uncertainty, 5.2 is still far from where we need to be to ensure every single child from Portland to Pendleton receives the high quality education that they deserve. Now, filling the funding gap isn't the end all answer, but we do need adequate resources so that we can continue meeting the needs of the students already succeeding and the needs of the students who are struggling. Oregon's education system is strong, but we do have some things to work on. We have an achievement gap, a gap between minority student performance and their white counterparts. And we have a moral obligation to change that. We are going to change that. 
When we break... When we break down the testing results, they show that not all of our students are achieving to the high level we know that they can. Hispanic and African American student test scores have increased in recent years, which is good, but the acceleration of improvement has to be faster. Last year, only 30% of Hispanic and African American students met state benchmarks for eighth grade math, compared to about 60% of white students. 36% of Hispanic students and 42% of African American students met eighth grade benchmarks for reading, compared to nearly 70% of white students. And I know that no one in this room thinks that this divide is acceptable. But again, without adequate resources, we create obstacles, not paths, to student su success. We are shifting from a standard of universal access to an education in this country to a standard of universal proficiency. And in order to reach this goal, we must serve all students better. We know they can and will perform better if we make investments in the strategies that we know work. If we want equal access to education that translates into equal access to opportunities, we must reduce class size, increase specialists to help students that need it most, provide quality ongoing professional development to give teachers the tools and skills they need, and ensure all of our schools are healthy learning environments that promote academic excellence for everyone. We know we have great teachers, the best in the nation, and it's known nationally now, too. We recently collected data regarding, uh, relating, rather, to what percentage of classes are taught by a highly qualified teacher according to the new federal definition under the No Child Left Behind Act. And in Oregon, we are among the nation's leaders with more than 80% placement in our classrooms. And it's important for me to note that there are no unqualified teachers in Oregon. Our state has one of the highest standards for teacher certification of all states, and our students are proof that our teachers are excellent. The most startling information that this data did reveal, however, is the gap between the percentage of teachers who met the federal definition in Title I schools the schools that have the highest population of low-income students and our more prosperous school districts. We know our students are smart. We know our students can meet high expectations. But we have an obligation to ensure that there are adequate and accessible resources for every school, regardless of race or socioeconomic class. And that includes making sure every student has the best instruction we have to offer. Our schools are working hard with fewer resources, and we will continue working our hardest. But we must also begin to work differently with the resources that we have. And one way to work differently is through more public-private partnerships, such as Back to School Week, schools uniting, the Schools Uniting Neighborhoods program that's happening here, and Kids on the Block, which are all here in the Portland area. They are excellent examples of ways to engage more people from the community to partner with our schools. We're working with school districts to expand their efforts to collaborate with their local government agencies, businesses, and civic organizations because we need everyone to be involved in creating more success for our kids. Well, now I'd like to turn to um, the political component of education. This summer, right after our legislature closed the longest session in Oregon history with an education budget of $5.2 billion, the usual anti-tax advocates hit the streets with petitions claiming taxation with poor representation. Well, I don't know what the chances are that this measure is going to qualify for the ballot, but I do know what it's going to mean for our schools. If we have a special election in February to vote on the legislature's revenue package, a compromise that our elected officials on both sides of the aisle crafted, and it's overturned, we will be looking at $4.8 billion for education over the next two years. Well, when I'm in Salem, I get involved in the debate about school funding. It's my job to voice to the legislature what 
5.2 or $6.1 billion means for education. And I have told the legislature repeatedly that $4.8 billion isn't just a number, it's a policy choice, and it's a really bad policy choice for our schools. Over the next several months, I will talk with communities throughout the state about the facts. Just as I let the legislature know that four, what $4.8 billion means, I will be traveling around the state to make sure that the people of Oregon also know. Because before anyone agrees to sign those petitions, everyone needs to know what signing may mean for our schools. <laughs> At $4.8 billion, Multnomah County Schools will have to increase fees for registration, ba band, books, and athletics. Coos Bay would have to cut 19 days from the school year. North Clackamas would cut staff, librarians, counselors, computer trainers, teachers, the Dalles would have three bad choices, to cut days, cut teachers, deplete reserves. Tiger Tualatin already had to cut 70 teachers, and the result of 4.8 would mean cutting more people or cutting days. But this doesn't have to be our reality, and neither do the yearly battles that result in record numbers of legislative special sessions, the longest regular session in the history of the state, the shortest school year, or the highest unemployment rate in the nation. But in order to move past fun the funding debate and back to the real issue of where we want to be in 10 or 20 or 50 years from now, the people of Oregon need to understand the difference between the myths and the facts about public education in Oregon. It worries me that talk show hosts and political party leaders are spreading inaccurate information about education funding. Well, here are some of the things I hear and how I respond. Myth number one, we send money to schools and then we don't know where the money goes. Well, we absolutely do know where it goes and it is information that every person has access to. Each of our 198 school districts provide their financial information to the Oregon Department of Education and we post it on our website. If you look on the department's homepage, you will find financial information under the heading, How Schools Spend Tax Dollars. <laughs> and I'm working with our education partners to ensure that every district has a user-friendly version of their budget on their website as well. And when you go to our website, you will see that the money allocated for schools goes to salaries for our teachers, teaching assistants, bus maintenance and bus drivers, cafeteria staff, building maintenance, principals, counselors, speech pathologists, special education staff, the very things that schools should be spending their money on. Our money doesn't go into a black hole. It goes back to our children. It goes into the economic future of the state of Oregon. Well, myth number two. Schools would be fine if we just cut administration. Well, this is simply not true. The Secretary of State's audit report shows that we spend 8% of total school funds on administration, not an unreasonable level of investment. And that's defining administration broadly to include principals and vice principals. Central administration alone is closer to 5% of total school spending. And maybe it helps to know what administration means it means more than salaries. It means leadership in our schools, strong role models for our students. It's the people and computers that help us measure student performance. Administration means accountability in our schools. Of course, we're always looking for ways to make spending more efficient, and we'll continue to do that. But the answer to our school funding crisis is not to cut administration. Myth number three. Oregon is spending hundreds of dollars on the school, hundreds of millions of dollars on the school reforms. Again, not true. Kevin Mannix is going around saying it costs $500 million to have a system of standards, assessment, and accountability. But the reality is that Oregon could say very little by eliminating the Certificate of Initial Mastery and Certificate of Advanced Mastery. These assessment tools cost around 20 to $25 million a year and were even streamlined during this last legislative session to give more flexibility to schools and districts 
which helps reduce costs. And because we have this system of evaluation in place, Oregon was ahead of the game when the federal No Child Left Behind law was enacted because it mandates standards and assessments. We would have had to implement an entirely new system of assessment this year if the one we have now didn't exist. So really, we saved money this biennium because it costs much more to create and implement a new system than to maintain the one we already have and know works well. And we've received high praise from educators around the country for our high standards, comprehensive assessments, and use of that data to improve instruction for students who need it most. Myth number four, that we're spending much more than other states and have nothing to show for it. Again, not true. As a study done a couple of years ago shows that we are spending about $7,100 per student compared to a national average of $6,900. Well, that's about a 3% difference than the national average, while students in Oregon are performing at higher than average levels. No one can argue that we are not getting a good return on that investment. And I, for one, for one don't want to get into a race to the bottom. Well-funded schools are good government policy, and we are leaders in this country when it comes to public education. Well, I already provided examples that our students have the best SAT and ACT scores in the nation, and that our third graders are all improving in math and reading. But the real proof is what you see in our classrooms. When people try to tell me that we aren't getting high-quality results from our schools, I ask them, when was the last time you visited a school? And usually the answer is, oh, 20 years ago when I was in school maybe, or never. So I share with them what I see in communities throughout the state, and I encourage all of you to do the same. I see boys and girls learning and laughing, reading and thinking, working in teams to solve math problems. I see kids sparked and loving school. You know, so many people use the tired phrase that we're at a crossroads. Well, the fact is, we're not at a crossroads when it comes to school funding. We've started down the wrong path. But we have an opportunity to create a new path that takes us where we can and should be, a state that invests in academic success for every single child, everyone, every day, a success. And there is so much more that we're doing at the department and, and in our schools that I haven't had time to talk to about today. And it's frustrating to me that because of this threat of funding to our schools that my time is having to be split between working on policy and dispelling myths of, about education so the public knows what $4.8 billion means. And what I want to be devoting my attention to are the great initiatives that are taking place on improving middle schools and our high schools and improving literacy at proficiency levels and, and the work that we have going on in the department on trying to make ourselves work better so that we can help our schools more and the great work that's happening here in our metro area schools. When we're focused on the substance of education at the department and in our schools, not the funding uncertainties, we all win. When we have an educated populace, we have less crime, less drug abuse, fewer teen pregnancies, and citizens equipped with the skills and knowledge for life in the 21st century. Tomorrow, as the paper called it, America's birth certificate is coming to Portland. The great words of the Declaration of Independence represent the ideals we have for our society. We speak with pride about being the land of opportunity and that everyone has the right to the pursuit of happiness. But in order to make sure that every child in this land does have the opportunities to pursue happiness, we must ensure that they have an education because education is the key to this inalienable right. Thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing to help support our schools. Thanks. Now comes the interesting question and answer period. And as you know, one of the benefits of City Club membership is being able to ask questions of our 
noted speakers. Uh, today, Chris Smith, who is our board host, and he is the lead internet technologist with Intel, or, or <coughs> the lead internet technologist with Xerox. <laughs> He's been very helpful in advising us the technology on, at the club. He will have the privilege of asking the first question, and he'll be followed by the question from Carol Witherall, who is a professor of education at Lewis and Clark. We will then open the microphone. It would appear that our line is already forming, so please do get up and ask questions of our speaker. Thank you. Well, Susan, thank you for reminding us of the good news in Oregon education. Uh, I think we often overlook that as we uh, look at the travails we're going through right now. Uh, as you said, the funding level is not just a budgetary question, it's a policy question. Um, and both budgetary and policy questions uh, wind up in the realm of politics. And my question to you uh, is, a, is a nagging political question that I've had uh, as I've followed this debate, um, including um, serving on the, the committee that wrote the charge for the current City Club Committee uh, that's studying education finance. You referenced the quality education model and said that it would take roughly $6.5 billion to fund the quality education model in this biennium. Uh, my question is, uh, every time I hear the quality education model discussed in this debate, uh, it's usually put in the context of a number that's out of reach. Uh, and when our charge writing committee talked to superintendents uh, about education funding, we also heard that same comment, that the quality education model simply wasn't a political reality. Uh, and I want to understand why, because I've read it. It's not an outrageous document. The costs that are uh, outlined in that are all reasonable costs. There's nothing. Uh, <laughs> luxurious at all in the quality education model, and it was developed in a bipartisan process in the legislature. So why is it that we're not reaching for the quality education model in our political discussion? Well, I have to t I'll answer the question, but I also have to tell you that I asked the same question. <laughs> I, that, that's my question for the legislature. Uh, you know, they are the ones who decide what we're going to invest in education in, this, in our state. And that is my question to them. We have a tool, this incredible tool, that helps connect the levels of investments needed to get the results we want. And this was, has been developed over, over many years. A lot of certified smart people around our state have gotten together and worked on this model, and it does make that connection. And, uh, and so when we are having those discussions about how much is enough for education, we continue to have those debates. And the model was developed to try to help us with those debates, to try to remove the politics of the deba debate and just have you know, decisions based on really good data. So as we look at the model, I guess you know, my, what I encourage the legislature to do is they're making their decisions on what level we're going to be investing in is I ask the question, OK, the model tells us it takes this to get the results we want, which is 90% of kids. We really want 100% of kids. And right now, the Quality Education Commission is refining the model to see, so how much would it be if we were aiming for 100%? So my question to the legislature, and what I tried to frame the, the discussion around as I went before them this legislative session, was, so what do you want to pay for? We know if the, if the funding is below that level, then, then these are the outcomes we can expect. We're not going to get to 90% of kids then. You know, how are we going to close the achievement gap if we aren't going to be uh, making the investments that we need uh, to be making? So I try to help them focus on, on it's not so much the number, it's, it's the results. What do we want? How much does that cost? And then how do, we get, how do we get the funds to pay for that, to deliver that for the children of this state, for the future of this state? But I will say, you know, we can't be, we can't get hung up either on the fact that we don't have it, <laughs> and we have to say, okay, with the money that we have, how do we make the best decisions possible on creating success for kids? How do we work differently and in a more targeted way to get the most back um, from that those investments? And so, um, that you know, we are doing that, and we, and today we have better data than we've ever had before to make better decisions about how we create more success for kids. And so there, it's a, it's a very exciting time in education because we know 
how to create success for kids. We know what it takes to do that. And what we need is for, and we're willing to say, we will be accountable for delivering the, the results that we all want. But we need for the state lawmakers to be accountable in delivering the resources and, su and support that we need to get the results that we all want. Carol Witherell, City Club member. Thank you, Superintendent Castillo, for your inspiring remarks and your vision of Oregon's future. I bring this question as co-chair of the Education and Human Development Committee, yeah. um, and we'd like you to jump forward seven years. It is now 2010. Oregon's public schools have made terrific strides forward as measured by all students' gain in learning, their well-being, their enjoyment of school, and their graduation rates. Oregon citizens' confidence in and support for their schools has never been stronger. How did we accomplish these remarkable <laughs> strides forward? What were the priorities and key strategies that will be lessons for the future? Yeah, wow. I love that image, that's terrific. Um, well, I think it begins with uh, what I'm trying to do today, and that is to help us keep focused on where we're trying, you know, what we are trying to aim for, and the fact that we have a winning program for the people of this state to invest in, but so many people don't know that. And, and that's what I spend a lot of my time doing, is trying to help people understand what is going on in our public education system today, that we know how to create success for more kids. We need their help and support to do it for all children. And, um, and, 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 and we need more people engaged in that effort. So I guess we get there by, continuing to have the dialogue and helping to give good information and, and facts out to the public about what's happening in our schools, um, working with more partners. We have a number of people here from foundations that are stepping up in a big way to help our schools. They know uh, and see where we can make investments that will make a huge difference for children, and they're stepping up in a big way in Oregon. So having more partners who join in the effort, and really I want us to be having a discussion in this state about how it is every person's responsibility to make sure that all children have a successful education. It's everyone's responsibility, and we all need to be working together. And as I look in this room, I mean, it's filled with people who are stepping up in a big way to help our schools, so thank you for all that you're doing, but I think it is. It's about people having good information. People will back a winner. I, the one example I use is the Duck football team. When they became a winning program, let me tell you, money started pouring into that program. I don't know how many of you have been to Autzen Stadium recently, but it is this palace to football uh, as people have stepped up and made those investments in that program. People will back a winner and we have a winning program for them and inve to invest in. But unfortunately, what they mostly are hearing about our schools today is about shortened school years and teacher layoffs. And, um, and so we need to change that and we need to help people understand that, that we have something very worthwhile to invest in and uh, make the connection about what we all get back for that investment. We benefit in countless ways by investing in education. Thank you. Hi, my, my name is Pavel Goberman, member of City Club and candidate for US Senate position. Uh, taxpayers pay 43% of our budget go to school. 43%, huge amount of money. Uh, why? You and other politicians, as uh, Commissioner Bureau of Labor, Dan Gardner, stupid government, K Kulangovsky, have no any ability to run business, run for public office, and lie to people. Is that a question, Mr. Governor? Why you, question, simple. Why you have no any ability, you, Gardner, stupid Kulangovsky, have no any ability to run business, run for office? I guess if, if I, to answer your question, I guess what if your question is um, if I run for for U.S. senator, Mr. I have Mr. agenda Mr. to help Mr. nation. Mr. That is not appropriate. Please, you've asked your question. Thank you. <laughs> Thirty seconds. Thank you. Okay, answer, please. Uh, if your, quest lost. If your question is about if your question is about what. 
I'm trying to answer the question. <laughs> if your question was about, I know you're, you're concerned about how much of our state budget does go to education. I think I'll take the next question. <laughs> Sorry to follow that. <laughs> My name is Deb Andrews. I'm a member of City Club. When you spoke of minority performance made me think of Humboldt Elementary School where mm. the majority of kindergartners are expected to be reading in kindergarten. That far exceeds benchmarks and standards. Gifted minority and disadvantaged children suffer the most from lack of enrichment and lack of challenge since their parents are not uh, able to do that privately. The legislature has just eliminated all funding for talented and gifted in the state. I was wondering if the State Department of Education or the State Board is concerned about that and what plans do they have to make sure that these children are challenged so that they do not mentally or physically drop out when the curriculum isn't keeping up. Absolutely, we're concerned about it. We all should be outraged about the funding being cut. We should be outraged that we don't have as many nurses today in our schools or counselors in our, day, in our schools that we should have. I mean, there are a lot of outrageous things happening uh, today on funding uh, for our schools and not, you know, uh, and, and these kinds of programs going away, you bet. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, as, as we are working at the Department of Education and around the state, as all of us are working today on how we move forward and try to create success for all children, we are, we very much are using a different kind of language about how we talk about creating success for kids. And it's all about, you know, each child's success and being focused, more student focused and having high schools that are more student focused. And, and, um, and, and so it's all about every single child and being focused on the success for every single child if that's a talented and gifted child if it's a child that's really struggling you know to try to get to our standards but you're absolutely right um, we should be concerned about that investment and we are and we are looking at ways that we continue to move forward and do what we can to meet the needs of every child and that we continue to challenge our students we know that students want to be challenged they want rigor in our schools um, you know, the, the, we, today we talk a lot about the new three R's in education, relationships, relevance, and rigor. And we know that relationships for students in our schools is very, very important. And having a mentor or someone that they connect with that helps them uh, know that someone is tracking and cares about what kind of education experience that they're going to have and that we have work to do to improve those opportunities. Making learning more relevant for students in our schools and doing what we can there with our pro programs. And then absolutely students want to be challenged. I have a, a student advisory uh, team of, made up of students from all around the state and um, one of their recommendations to me has been that all students should be required to get a SIM, which is a high level of achievement. And my question to them was, so do you believe that all of your fellow students <laughs> could achieve a SIM? And they said, yeah. And students have very high expectations for themselves, much higher than, we, than, than oftentimes we do for them. And so they want to be challenged. They want high levels of achievement. And, uh, and we need to help them get there. Thank you for coming and sharing with us today. Thanks. My name is Chris Allman, and I'm a City Club member. And uh, first of all, I thank you for your vision. And I really appreciate the fact that you, as a former legislator, have a uh, perspective that uh, can combine with the goals of what uh, we need to do to improve our education. Um, Harry and Steve just had an article earlier this week out that talked about the conundrum that uh, schools are facing with regards to funding, how you, in fact, uh, referred to the budget being more, more like $4.8 billion if the income tax surcharge is overturned. And in point of fact, uh, many schools not only are not using that money out of fear that it's not going to be there now, but there's also the issue that the PERS money is money that is uncertain. And as an example, um, our Beaverton School District is um, holding at this point right now um, upwards of $25 million uh, with the income tax surcharge and PERS money with the fears that this is not going to be there, with the fears that our voters are not going to, in particular in February, 
back us up. And in Beaverton, we had the luxury of having passed a levy, which is part of a problem for us. Mm -hmm. I want to know what your feelings are of what schools should do regarding um, this PERS money and um, the income tax surcharge money. Should we be spending it? Yeah, it's a great question because, um, you know, um, my job is to direct our schools to follow the laws that we have in the state of Oregon. And when the state lawmakers pass a budget of $5.2 billion, that is the law. That is their allocation. However, <laughs> because we have this referendum, this possible referendum before us, uh, we know that it is an uncertain time. And I know that our um, administrators all across the state are being very conservative with their budgets because of this uncertainty. So yes, the lawmakers have given us $5.2 billion, but I know that um, you know it is a time, it is an, an uncertain time, and then as you said, we don't know what the outcome of these court cases uh, related to PERS is gonna be. And I just have to say that um, Uncertainty is the last thing that our districts needed after last year. You will remember we had those five special sessions. Budgets were cut a number of times. We had school closures across the state. You know, what was mentioned earlier, we were in Doonesbury because of what was happening with our districts. And here we go again, another year of uncertainty. It was the last thing that our schools needed. We have a new superintendent in the Bethel District, Bethel School District, which is in Eugene, that I visited with on the first day of school, and I went to visit him, and um, he came to us from Nevada and said, whoa, I'm so impressed with what's happening in education in Oregon, but you know, in Nevada, we don't have to worry about this uncertainty with, our, with the budgets, and you can count on having you know, what you're told you're gonna have at the beginning of the year, you can count on it being that at the end of the school year, and uh, so we've gotta fix that. Markowitz from City Club. Is this on? Yes. People here? Um, Milt Markowitz from City Club. Um, hi, Milt. Well, hi, how are you? We had lunch a couple years ago, That's and right. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you um, at lunch two years ago. And, uh, and that was that uh, at the time I believed you were going to win and probably win two terms, and so I asked you in the year 2010 when we were 10 years into a 25-year sustainability executive order, how would education inform sustainability and sustainability is the work we needed to do um, inform education? Uh, and that's my question, but really specifically, do you see any major curricular changes that are necessary so that the kids that are graduating now or in school now really are prepared for the 21st century? That's a great question, and, and it is one that um, we are constantly asking at the Department of Education. Um, and are engaged with working with the experts across the country and other states and monitor what other states are doing, uh, look for new, um, you know, approaches. I mean, and, uh, you know, we're engaged in conferences. And so it, it is an ongoing discussion, and I think that all states are, are very much interested in, in figuring out how you do things differently. Everyone's struggling with their, all states, as we all know are struggling with their state budgets, and, um, and uh, so this is a time when people are trying to um, say with less, how do we you know, continue to try to help kids get to the levels that we need for them, we need for them to be at? And, uh, and, it, and, and so it is always asking the question of how do we do things differently? How do we prepare them better for the 21st century? And, and uh, so yes, I think um, absolutely. <laughs> Anything specific? that you see coming, that change in curriculum? Well, we just, um, let's see, we're, we're con we just finished some new curriculum changes uh, in math, and um, I know we've d we're doing some new things in social studies, and there's just ongoing work in all of the subject areas, so. Thank you. Yeah. John Leeper, City Club member. I wish to add my commendations for the leadership that uh, you've shown, as Thank well you. as the effort put forth by the teachers and administrators in the school system within Oregon. Thank you. Several weeks ago, Newsweek published a uh, list of the 100 top high schools in the country. As I looked at that list and just tried to go down and sort things out by state, I found over 30 of the top 100 were from New York. There was over five in, on that list from Florida, over five on it from Texas, I am, and none from Oregon. 
I am just curious as to uh, any perspective you might have on the objectivity of Newsweek's perspective on <laughs> how they arrived at that damn list. <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> um, that is a good question, and I'm gonna, I am going to look into that and find out why we weren't on that list. Uh, I don't know how, what criteria they used, but you know there are constantly um, people evaluating and measuring various school pro uh, schools around the country and their new reports that are coming out. It seems like all the time uh, on you know who is ranking where uh, in whether it's a subject area or graduation rates or whatever. Uh, and so I don't know what was used to do that evaluation in Newsweek, but I, I would like to know. Hi, my name's Marta Mellinger. And with, oh, probably the past 20 years, there's been an extraordinary amount of research that has indicated the impact that the arts can have on student achievement and learning. And I'd like to hear your reflections on what is the state doing to assure that arts education um, is embedded into the curriculum. Right. Um, as you know, we're, we did pass legislation this last session which um, s uh, requires the state to set the standards for arts education in the state. And so, um, you know, we have been very much engaged in, in that activity. Um, and um, we have a team of people that we were educators that we have been working with for some years, and we have been very supportive of the efforts on. Uh, trying to incorporate the arts um, more in our schools um, and trying to provide what support we can from the dis from the department level. Um, but you're, I know for arts educators, it has been a very frustrating decade as um, we've seen districts cut their budgets and it has meant that they have had reduced programs or, or reduced investments in the arts in their schools, but that hasn't happened everywhere. There has been, as you know, an effort uh, through um, arts education to help teachers um, look at how they can use it throughout the curriculum in schools. And I have visited a number of schools now where mm -hmm. when you walk in the door, Humboldt was mentioned earlier, Humboldt Elementary School, you walk in the door and art is everywhere and in all classes. And it is about, you know, it's leadership and, and, um, and trying to find ways that you can continue to do that and move ahead on that. And so um, we absolutely have some, you know, some work to do in that, in that area for our schools. It is very, very important that we continue to, to support arts education in our schools. It is um, absolutely essential. It's not, it, should, it is not an extra. It should be an absolute core part of what we do to, to have a rich education experience for our children. And we know there are enormous benefits when it is emphasized in our programs, absolutely. Um, I'm Andrew Wheeler, a member. I'm a mouthpiece for Ned Look today, however. He has this question. What is the optimum number of students per class? What is the be uh, per the benchmark? And then um, how many students per class average are there now? And uh, what do you think would be the optimum number? Ah. Well, let's see. I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me. I know there, there are specific numbers in the quality education model. They, uh, they have a, a set of numbers for you know, all of the grade levels and, they, and the ideal number of classes to get the outcomes that we want. Right now, uh, I was saying I was in the Bethel School District and they had uh, fifth grade, fourth grade classes with 38 students in them. You know, Their first grade class had 28 kids in them. I mean, uh, and uh, they were, uh, what was amazing about that experience was that they had these crowded classrooms, these full classrooms, and, er, and, every, and I went in every class in, in this one school. And as I went in there, the teachers were just inspired and rolling up their sleeves and, you know, yeah, well, I have more kids. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I am going to do it, and I'm going to create success for all kids. And so it's, it's you know, all our schools, even when they're facing these very big class sizes, are trying to do the very best job they can to deliver success for those kids. But uh, I know that for a whole lot of schools across this state, the class sizes are way too large, 
And there is a concern that as we are trying to create success for every single child, it just creates obstacles to us trying to do that. And so um, is there an ideal number? Probably, you know, and I know there's probably debate about what the ideal number is, but, but um, I think what, what we all are looking at as well as class size is also the very important factor that um, that the teacher plays in those class in those classrooms and the need for us to make sure that we're providing the teacher with the support and the training and the tools that the teachers need because that has a huge impact on what happens to the success of those children class size yes that's that's a huge factor but also professional development and giving teachers the support they need um, is also a real critical part of creating success for kids in our schools. Hi, hi Susan, Jay Bloom, City Club member. Uh, 25 years ago, I had the privilege of serving on a school board in Massachusetts, and I'd say school board members are one of the most thankless jobs that are out there. Uh, and my kudos to the school board members who are here today yeah. and continue to serve. <laughs> cured me of politics at a young age, I'll tell you that. Um, my question for you, one of the big differences I've noticed in schools in the last 25 years is their openness and receptivity to other community groups, organizations, community involvement, uh, assisting in their work. And I, would care, I wonder if you'd care to comment how we can continue to increase that momentum. Absolutely. Well, as I said earlier, um, we do have uh, a lot of community organizations that are stepping up. I was just at a news conference with uh, Chair Lynn the other day. I don't know. If she, I guess I don't know if she's still here. Um, and we were talking about uh, we were celebrating the expansion of the Sun School program here in the Portland area that really brings together various levels of government. You have the city, the county, the school district and community organizations and social service agencies all working together to try to uh, come in and you know evaluate schools and find out what what it is they need to help create success for all kids in those schools and they are seeing wonderful results and are now expanding that program and um, I'm looking at that and saying you know how can we replicate that in other communities around the state how do we spread use those best practices and and connect other communities with that so um, it is a time for us, especially when we're dealing with the budgets that we have today for schools. We need more help than ever from community organizations and individuals around the state to help us deliver success for kids. And we can all do that together. We can achieve that. But it takes us all working together in a new way like we never have before. And as I said earlier, we have um, the foundations, major foundations of this state that are really focused on education in our schools right now. And I love that it is the, their focus right now because they are going to help us. They're, they are stepping up with resources and <coughs> investing in very targeted ways that are going to help us. I think we all are aware of the investments by uh, Meyer Memorial Trust and the Gates Foundation right now in helping us with high school, our high school improvement efforts. And uh, it's very, very exciting to see what's happening around that. Time. Just for one more question, thank you. This should be a short one. This is Bill Savage, City Club member. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, particularly for your comments of, in support of teachers. That it's not always been the case for people sitting in your, your chair. Um, <laughs> secondly, uh, <coughs> I need some help. When I'm talking about in support of a, a ballot measure, in support of schools, often it seems like everybody keeps saying, there's these high paid administrators in the Portland School District. They're earning over, I don't know what it is, high, uh, not high six figures, but high, high hundreds or high two hundred thousands for PR people. It, can you help me? I mean, is that true? <laughs> and how do I respond to these? <laughs> no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's what I was just going to say. I think your superintendent <laughs> is here and. Uh, <laughs> Um, as I said, you know, we do have um, the database initiative in the state and, and school districts do have their financial information that's available on how they're spending the dollars that they have um, in their districts and I'm sure that Jim can provide you with all of that information. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for being here today, and we look forward to seeing you next Friday for information about what's going on in Clark County. Thanks. We're adjourned.